Hello and welcome. My name is Hugh Williams and I'm the editor of Jane's International Defence Review. I have the pleasure of uh, welcoming you to today's uh, online intelligence briefing where my colleague Sean O'Connor, who is a principal research analyst, uh, will provide a, a detailed uh, examination of China's strategic sound force. Um, I've been fortunate enough to have a preview of today's event and uh, it's a great mix of technology, capability and disposition information. Um, so it's uh, something to really look forward to. Uh, now today's briefing is one of a program of approximately uh, 40 events that we will be holding uh, during 2017 and is available to all customers of Jane's Intelligence Center and module products, including the market's forecast products. And I will conclude my uh, introduction. But before I hand over to, to Sean, I'd like to highlight that the information used to, to compile today's presentation has been drawn from a variety of, of sources, a uh, variety of Jane's sources, uh, but primarily from Jane's Military and Security Assessments Intelligence Center. Over to you, Sean. Okay, good day everyone. My name is Sean O'Connor and I'm the Principal Research Analyst for Jane's. And today we're going to look at a number of details surrounding China's strategic SAM force. We'll start with a little bit of historical information and then we'll proceed into a look at the individual systems and their technical capabilities that are currently employed. We'll then look at the SAM network as a whole, the coverage zones and site deployments, and then we'll look at some of the future aspects of the system, some of the things we expect to see coming online for the next few years, as well as potential impacts on the global export market. So we'll start with a look at the current strategic SAM force. The strategic SAM force was created in the 1950s, and China received the SA-75 Divina, which was an export model of the SA-2 or S-75, and they inducted it as the HQ-1. And we know from Russian export logs, they received three batteries in 1958 and a further two batteries in 1959. Now, following this period, the political relationship between the People's Republic and the USSR deteriorated. And as such, China started to domestically produce the HQ-1 to fill out a strategic SAM force, and they then inducted that as the HQ-2 system, which is still in service today. In terms of operational use, between 1967 and 1970, the Chinese Air Force, or PLAAF, operated HQ-2s did manage to shoot down five U-2s that were flown by Republic of China pilots operating out of Taiwan. Now, if we fast forward a couple of decades, the improved relationship with both the USSR and Russia in the late, nine, the late 80s and early 90s drew the battery and sent it back to mainland China, loading it onto ships for transshipment. And shortly after that process took place, they deployed another HQ-9 battery down here. So there's been pretty continuous SAM presence on Woody Island. What this indicates to us is that Woody Island may now represent a possible rotational deployment site. And we'll talk more about those in a little bit. Uh, for the Chinese SAM force. And here are those S3, uh, S400 components that we've noted undergoing checkout at Kapustin Yard. You can see this right here shows about uh, four firing batteries worth of equipment. And if we go to the next slide, we've got another four firing batteries worth of equipment as well, along with another collection of 40V6 mast assemblies for all the different radar components. So what happens here is these systems are, once they're done being produced, they're sent down to Kapustin Yard to undergo checkout. And what that basically entails is connecting all the components to the engagement radar, activating the engagement radar, and making sure the components are all communicating with each other effectively. You can kind of see some of the cable connections that are in here. And it also allows them to check out and make sure there haven't been any manufacturing issues or defects in the process. And once that's completed, all of these systems will be then sent to a transshipment point following the uh, travel by rail from Kapustin Yar, and then they'll be delivered to either the Russian military or to an export client. Given the timeline involved in checkout of these components and the known orders that have been placed by the Chinese military, we currently assess these five batteries that have been spotted to be Chinese sourced or Chinese export uh, material. Okay, now we'll look at some of the capabilities contained within the Chinese air defense network. The strategic SAM systems are largely deployed to defend key facilities and locations, including capital area air defense. You'll notice there's going to be a large concentration of missile sites around Beijing. 
They were also used to defend major naval facilities and certain air bases and military complexes elsewhere in the country. They've established a barrier air defense network along the eastern border and coastline region, primarily using Russian long-range SAM systems. The high mobility of most of their newer SAM systems is going to allow them to rapidly redeploy systems where needed and to provide for network optimization in the future. They also do maintain a number of tactical SAM systems available to perform gap filling and close in defense functions. And the spread of EW complexes or early warning radar sites throughout China provide near total coverage and provide more than enough coverage to provide support to the strategic air defense network. In terms of anti-missile capabilities, all of the S-300P series variants offer a degree of ATBM capability. Both the 48N6C and E2 used in the PMU-1 and 2 systems can engage ballistic targets to a range of 40 kilometers, and the 64N6E actually uses a specific sector scan mode specifically designed for ballistic target detection using a scan mode of 60 degrees in avimus and up to 75 degrees in elevation. The 48N6 series also uses a directional warhead that's been shown to be able to cause the detonation of a targeted conventional warhead during anti-missile testing in Russia and Kapustin Yar as well. The HQ-9 being developed largely from the S-300P and Patriot system may offer a similar degree of ATBM capability, and potential targets in the ATBM role include ATACMs or TNC service-to-service missiles fired from Taiwan. So as we look around some of these coverage zones, the following graphics are going to show us coverage in various regions. The small dark red circles and icons, they'll obviously be the smallest ones on the slide having the shortest range, are HQ-2 systems. The large red circles and icons are various S-300P variants. The orange circles and icons are the HQ-9, and the green ones are the HQ-12. The ranges represent the maximum engagement ranges for aerial targets. It should be noted that these are notional and do not account for potentially assigned sectors, in which case a given engagement radar may be slaved down a certain azimuth, and then it would likely be used to scan either. And so what we'll look at now are some key takeaways from the presentation. So with a reduction <coughs> excuse me, of the HQ-2 force and replacement by newer systems, the Chinese strategic SAM force is becoming much more survivable and much more effective. Yeah, it's introducing systems with much longer engagement ranges, allowing them to cover more of their airspace, and it's allowing them to introduce systems with much better multi-target engagement capability. It's also becoming more survivable in that most of their new strategic SAM systems are offering high mobility, given that they're mounted on mobile, mobile launch vehicles and use mobile radars. One of the things that's interesting is they're not assessed to be quite as maneuverable as the S-300P series. The S-300P and S-400 can basically set up or tear down on a launch site within five minutes. And this has been verified in various exercises and test programs within Russia. Basically, they can be, an S-300P battery can be driving down the street. Somebody can say, stop. And within five minutes, that battery can have set up and placed everything tied into its location and be prepared to fire. The Chinese systems are assessed to be slightly less mobile. Uh, in some cases, such as the HQ-12, they're assessed to have a setup or teardown time of approximately 20 minutes. And so while this doesn't offer them the high mobility of an S-300P system, it does offer them significantly greater mobility when compared to something like the HQ-2, which is largely a fixed system tied to a specific location. The continued increases in their capability is also going to bring the additional ability to prosecute stealth targets as well as increased anti-missile defense capabilities. And their missile systems are also becoming more and more and more comparable to foreign equivalents. And this is resulting in both increased effectiveness for their network as a whole, and it will potentially offer them an increased potential share of the export market in the future moving forward. Uh, we've seen they have started to break into some of the Central and Southeastern Asia countries, and some other countries that represent potential targets for Chinese missile systems include places in South America and in Africa as well. Thanks, Sean. Uh, unfortunately, I think you know people would uh, love for us to carry on for longer, but we have uh, hit the the end of the uh, the session, uh, and this will conclude the seminar. Thanks again to you. That was a fantastic uh, presentation. A lot of great insight and some, some real interesting nuggets to take away and, and mull over. So I'll, I'll conclude things yeah. here, and thank you for joining us today, uh, everybody. Mm -hmm.